This podcast is brought to you by Kiefer Hurt. Whether you're feeling the effects of menopause or your menstrual cycle, discover what's key for you in less than five minutes with tailored supplement recommendations, information and insights on kieferher.com. Hi, I'm Renee. And I'm Donna. Welcome to the Key For Her podcast. In this series, we aim to educate and open up honest conversations with both medical professionals and real life women. We want to shine a light on those topics that sometimes go unspoken about and help empower women to know what is key for their health and well-being. Hi, Kriva. Thank you for joining us today on the Key For Her podcast. Cleveland Hi Donna, here. how are you doing? Hi, I'm good. What a lovely sunny day it is where you are. <laughs> lovely, yeah. We'll get the last bit of sunshine while we, well, we take it while we can get it. The last out of the summer, you know, so. <laughs> <laughs> so today we're going to talk about uh, contraceptive options and, um, and what's available to us and what we should know about all these different options that are available. Okay, I think a good place to start might be just to talk about who needs contraception and I think one of the things about perimenopause and menopause is people getting really confused do I like if I make my period stop do I still need birth control or do I not and that can really trip people up so we tend to use what's called the FSRH guidance so that's the faculty of sexual and reproductive health so that's UK based so their guidelines would be that in general if you're having periods so women of a reproductive age if they want to avoid pregnancy they need to have some contraception on board for perimenopausal women if your periods have become irregular but you haven't gone two full years with no period if you're under 50 you still need birth control so even a woman who comes into me say she's 40 and she's had no period in a year and we die we look at blood tests in that case and we would say look you've had some ovarian insufficiency is what they call it so you're your you know your ovaries are not regularly ovulating you're not producing hormones in any significant way anymore, there is still a one to 2% chance that that person has spontaneous ovulation over the next year. Yes. So you still, if it's, you know, and obviously that's a very individual decision, you know, that might be something some people welcome and they want a pregnancy or not or whatever, but if you're trying to avoid a pregnancy, you need to be on contraception in that case. So it's very (laughs) interesting that it's two years because the benchmark kind of is, you know, you're in menopause after 12 months of not having a period. So that's, very very good tip and things to be aware of if you are in perimenopause you have to be a full two years without if you're under men- 50 so women aged under 50 need to have two full years of no, of amenorrhea which is the medical term for saying no bleeding no periods before they can be reasonably certain that they can stop using contraception and then if you're over 50 and you've gone a year with no period we're usually happy enough to say, okay, you no longer require contraception for okay. everybody else. If you still having periods in your fifties, once you reach 55, again, the guidance would be that most women over 55 no longer need contraception at all. Okay. So two years under 50, one year over 50 and age of 55, they're your kind of benchmarks. And then if we're to look at the other end of the scale, when, what is the age where a girl could start taking say the pill or what are her options why would uh, a girl go on contraceptive um i've heard things like they've been prescribed for acne for for different problems with with menstrual pain um if you could discuss just discuss i suppose from your own experience of you know dealing with mums and their daughters and younger Mm. girls coming in Yes, I, w- I would have worked um, in more as sort of more general. It was women's health. So I, and I would have dealt with this on a regular basis. And I think opening up that discussion and sort of taking away the fear of almost saying for younger girls, well, if you go on the pill, it's like we're advocating that it's OK for you to be having sex. And in my head, the two things are not a- equatable at all. Yeah. Discussion and conversation and education and, you know, insisting that younger women deal with and struggle through what are often very disruptive periods or heavy periods or painful periods but that's not good either when we have very good options for managing that so you're Mm -hmm. absolutely right using hormones for younger women for sorry for any woman at any point is not 
just for contraception. There are women who don't, it's not birth control. They're not sexually active. They don't want birth control, but their periods are painful. And because birth control will often reduce the amount of bleeding, there's some types of birth control that stop you bleeding at all. It solves that problem. I have women who, um, you know, you can see athletes, female athletes might not. It's very disruptive if you're swimming to have to time everything around having yeah. a period or not. Or maybe you just don't want to have a period. That's okay too. Like you don't have mm -hmm. to justify it. Or maybe, you know, women with endometriosis who get very painful periods a lot of the time um, and they miss school or they miss work. Or again, they just don't want to be dealing with the pain every month. That is a totally acceptable reason to take something. Um, and, you know, women who are anemic, if you have very heavy bleeding, you can have chronic fatigue from mm -hmm. chronic anemia, from chronic heavy bleeding and, and contraception, hormonal contraception is often a very good way of, of fixing that. Um, women with polycystic ovarian syndrome, some women with PCOS will have irregular periods. And so contraception can achieve two things. Number one, it can give them something regular so that they can actually, you know, like know when to expect their period. And that can have an impact on how they plan their life and schedule their life. It can be beneficial. Yeah. And we know women who get very irregular periods, if you get big, big gaps between your periods when you're younger in particular, that can have a small increased uh, risk of endometrial or womb cancer. And addressing that sometimes with hormonal contraception can reduce that risk. So they get a bad rap, I think, at times. Mm -hmm. But actually, look, time and a place, individuality, it's like with HRT. Um, and I think, yeah, it really depends. You know, it's used for, for lots of different things, not just birth control. Mm. This, it's fascinating. And, you know, there's so much talk around HRT and menopause and perimenopause, but I do find that there isn't that much talk around this for younger girls. So I've, I know myself, spotty teenager running into the doctor saying, I need the pill and big red head mortified ran back out. Never got asked why I wanted it you know so those conversations are important um and maybe they start with the mom first and then you know hopefully with a doctor that has the understanding um and time to give uh to these girls so so if a girl did want to start whether it be to manage symptoms or to have birth control what age can she start taking uh, something and what would be her options? So anyone who is menstruating can be put on hormonal, can start hormonal contraception. Really? Okay. Yeah. And maybe it's more appropriate in some cases to start with something non-hormonal and then progress mm. to something hormonal. But I'm just saying there's room for all of that to happen as a discussion. Uh, okay. And it really comes down to the, the individual uh, person involved, but there isn't a, a lower limit of age provided they're menstruating, if they're having periods, you know, they're ovulating, they're having hormonal change. Sometimes that warrants hormonal intervention, depending on the person. Understood. So, um, you know, so somebody, so, say a girl came in and she was 17, 18, and she's maybe starting to become sexually active. Uh, what are her options? Is there much discussion that goes on around which one to take? Because are they doing all the research themselves or and going in and saying this is what I want or just the doctor help them to decide? Depends on the on the person, I think. Yeah. And there's definitely I think you have to be careful, like with anything, like with HRT, like with fertility, like with anything. You know, you Google something and you get someone else's experience of something, but it's not necessarily applicable to you. So everything is a pinch of salt, like anything in medicine, I think, you know. Mm, and it's like uh, when you're younger as well, you do whatever your friends are doing, too. And so you copy them. Yeah, there's a herd so, mentality. You know, I think that, yeah. if you say younger, I think that probably lasts well into our... Yeah, no, it does. You know, <laughs> all into, Still guilty of that, I think. Totally, yeah. We just admit to it less, I think. But um, yeah, so say if you, you know, if I have someone of any age coming coming into me, I think looking at, so you, you start by looking at what their, what their apologies <laughs> about the interluder here um so you're looking at what they're trying to achieve with their yeah you know, what, what's what is problematic the dog wants to <laughs> he's very in interested in this conversation <laughs> yeah, i wonder why she's neutered so she shouldn't be uh. um, so, um, anyway yeah so i think you know 
I think having that discussion about what, why are you here? Like, is it for birth control? Is it for birth control plus something else? Yes. Is it because your periods are problematic or heavy or painful? Is it because of acne? So, you know, figure out first what the issue is. And then if it's birth control, so if you're looking at contraception, it's useful to split it into things that are on prescription and things that are not. So okay. condoms are a good place to start. There's mm -hmm. spermicides, so you can buy gels that are, um, you know, um, toxic to sperm. So condoms and spermicides and the female diaphragm. Now, I'm showing my age a bit because I think they're probably used a bit less commonly now, but those things still exist. And for women who want to avoid, um, you know, taking anything on prescription, those barrier methods are perfectly acceptable. And then there's the good old fashioned either withdrawal or rhythm technique. So knowing your body and knowing, you know, changes in your cervical mucus and knowing if your periods are regular, knowing what times you're at higher risk than others. There, and that's kind of become more popular lately with this. And why not? Um, have you heard of uh, natural cycles? Yeah. Actually um, teamed up with uh, an aura ring and you put the ring on and it, it does your temperature um, and is able to tell you on the app when you're most fertile um, and when to avoid having sex. So. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, yeah technology is amazing. So, um, okay, so all that stuff is really, you know, I think that comes down to what, the person sitting in front of you with their yeah, body. So they're the non-hormonal options. Yeah. A lot of them are old school, but then they well, a lot of them are less of technology. So Sorry. they're going to be as good as you are at using them to some degree. Yeah, and, yeah. You know, and people are aware that condoms can break. And, you know, so these things are not as effective as other hormonal options, but for some women that might be perfectly acceptable. So there's individuality to this. So they're your non-prescriptions. So then looking at your prescription options, Again, you kind of separate it out into things that are short term. So things like the pill where you can stop it or start it or whatever it might be, um, or longer acting reversible contraception, which we'll come to, right? So if you look at the short term stuff, and I say short term, I mean, it's something that the patient themselves can stop or start. Okay. Do. So for most women, we're talking about, when we say the pill, we're talking about literally a pill that you take at most most days out of the month and it contains a combination of estrogen and progestin two hormones very similar to hrt but they're different estrogens and they're often different progestins and they're often always higher dose so that's the big difference between birth control and hrt okay much higher doses and what the combination birth control pill will do is stop you from ovulating so it's going to switch off ovulation from your ovaries it stops actually a lot of estrogen production from your ovaries but then you're replacing it with what is in the pill okay so you're not actually ovulating when you're on the pill no now you can if you're not very good at taking it which you know understandably i mean like i put my hand up and say i would be the first person to forget to take a pill every day mm -hmm. And one of the problems that we ran in that kind of doctors would have had with the, like doctors and patients would have with the pill is we used to prescribe it as 21 days in a row. So three weeks on, and then you'd have yes. a week of either placebo pills, so they'd be a different color, or you would just stop taking it for a week. And if you'd go, if you went more than seven days break, so if you would forget to restart your new pack when you're supposed to, you can get breakthrough ovulation happening. If you go seven days with no hormones, you're okay. But if you go eight or nine days without these hormones some women will ovulate with that that break on the hormone right okay that's at, then you're at risk of pregnancy but you don't think you're at risk of pregnancy because you're on the pill but yeah. yeah so with the way we prescribe it now really is most people i think probably prescribe the pill back to back so you either do three months in a row and then you take a week break or some people prescribe it as you just stay on it all the time you're taking an active pill all the time but if you get some bleeding take a break for four or five days and then go back on right okay and that way we minimize that issue of missing pills or forgetting to restart it. You're just in the habit of doing it all the time. Right. Okay. And with the pill, um, is there many side effects? Can women, some women be more sensitive to, because like you said, the hormones are stronger. Um, so, you know, what, what, is that the, the most uh, popular choice? the pill do you find or is it is there a mix? I think it's the most usable because most people find it really like palatable they're like oh yeah yeah I know, I know what it's like to mm. take it like it just seems like the most it's the easiest way to tiptoe into the water when it comes to birth control. yeah because it's just it's innocuous I take a pill every day and you, you know that's reasonable enough to do um 
but there are risks. So with the combination birth control pill, because it contains estrogen in a tablet form at a relatively high dose, some women can't take it. If you have a history of migraines, particularly migraine with aura, where you get changes in maybe your vision, that kind of thing with a migraine, if you've ever had a blood clot, or if you have risk factors for having a blood clot, so women who smoke, um, women who've had a family history, et cetera, we look at a few, no, it's not, it's complicated. And we look at all of these things in a sort of more overall way. So we add in your age, your weight, your smoking status, you do migraines, et cetera. And there will be certain women who cannot take the pill for that reason. Okay. We'd consider the risk of blood clotting too high. Most women don't get side effects of the estrogen. Estrogen suits most people. They feel well on it. Most of the side effects come from the second hormone, the progestin. And if you look right. at all the different brands of pill, 80, 90% of them use the same estrogen, maybe slightly different doses, but pretty much the same estrogen. What makes one brand different to the next, what makes one suit you and not the next is the progestin. And right. the side effects typically are either mood changes, headaches, breast tenderness, bloating, and some women can get an irregular bleeding passion in the first kind of three to six months. So they're the big issues that we would come across. Right. So it's like a uh, worsen menstrual symptoms if um, say it's, it doesn't quite suit you or, and that's why you would try a different type of pill. Cause I know yeah. for myself, um, when I was younger, it didn't suit me at all. And I tried a few different ones. I ended up going on to a, a, a something else. Um, but, uh, so, so the difference would be mostly the progesterone then in, in the other. Exactly. Options. Yeah. It's that progestogen that, that kind of for some people will give them side effects, which is why one brand would suit you, but not the next. Necessary. Right. Okay. Next, some women, doesn't matter what we put them on. Progestins in general just don't suit them. That's only a small percentage, but unfortunately for those women, it's just a bit more difficult to figure out what they'll feel well on. Okay. So, so I suppose that brings us to like, say the, um, the coil then uh, as another yeah. option. Yeah. So if you're looking at estrogen and progestin, there are two other options. Some people use what's called an Evra patch. So it's a patch. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And um, so that's really handy. And uh, and that's um, something that you wouldn't be taking every day. I suppose it's a bit like a HRT patch a little. (laughs) Um, You're applying it and and you're changing that. And then the other thing is a Nuva ring, which is a small, almost looks like a little rubber ring, like a hair bobbin. Mm -hmm. And that's inserted vaginally. um, And uh, and then that's left in place for a few weeks and then you change it. Um, and actually the bleeding passion is often better with the Nuva ring um, and it contains estrogen and progestin. So it's the same sort of thing as what we find in the pill, but just delivering it in a different route. Right. Okay. okay. And so that's just, you know, again, good to know your options. So there are your estrogen and progestin options. So kind of put them to one side. Yes. Okay. Women who can't take estrogen by mouth. So again, going back to your, you know, maybe women who smoke and they're over a certain age or women who smoke and they have a body mass index above a certain, you know, point, et cetera, who can't take estrogen because of a blood clotting risk. We'll use progesterone or progestogen only pills or progestogen only contraception. So okay. the progesterone only pill, or some people call it the mini pill. Yeah, so yeah, I've heard of the mini pill, yes. Yeah, and it's, it's really commonly used, and it would be what I would be our go-to for women over 50 looking for contraception. Okay. So um, there are two brands in Ireland at the moment. One of them has a three-hour window, so that's a bit of a nuisance. If you're three hours late taking it, it is a missed pill. Whoa, that yeah. is commitment. <laughs> it is, like you need to be on top mm. of your game, yeah, whereas the other one has a 12-hour window, so it's there's a bit more kind of leeway with it. And then we have a new type that isn't licensed yet in Ireland, but is coming and we'll have a longer, a longer window again and a bit more leeway to miss a pill. So there'll be a few more options. The long acting reversible contraceptions then are either the coil, Mm. which we can go to uh, or go through in a a second or uh, what's called a next planon, a little implantable bar or the bar is what people call it. Yeah. Um, so the bar is something that is inserted uh, usually by your GP and it goes into, I know not everybody will be watching this in terms of video, but I'm pointing to my upper, the inside of my upper arm. Um, so it's actually, it's inserted in your upper arm and it lasts for three years. Um, and then you get it removed and you can have it replaced if you want. So the coil is longer, right? Um, so the, and the bar is Depending three years. on the coil. Yes. The coil is, the bar is three years. There's a few different types of coil. And the last one then is the Depo injection, Depo Provera. Yes. 
nobody's favorite birth control i don't think for lots of different reasons but it's an it's, it's an injectable it usually goes into your bum it's every three months um there were some concerns that with depo because of the type of progestin in it that it can increase your risk of osteoporosis so we don't like women to be on it for more than a couple of years you'll often wow okay so especially our older group definitely maybe not the best option because no, or in a way, concerned. like it's not a great one to start when you're younger because then you yeah. end up having to change it because okay. so you know it's more I suppose there's maybe some women who fail other types of contraception who end up on and just suits them which is fine but it's it wouldn't be my go-to this podcast is brought to you by our very own brand key for her whether you're feeling the effects of menopause or your menstrual cycle discover what's key for you in less than five minutes with tailored supplement recommendations, information and insights on keyforher.com. Please have 20% off on us by using the promo code KEYPODCAST in all capitals. So looking at the coils, the coils are little, they're often little T-shaped devices. They're about as big as um, like the cap of a Bic Biro, I guess. Just yeah. The first thing that's come to hand. Um, <laughs> You know, they're smaller than your thumb, like they're quite small, but then so is your non-pregnant uterus, your womb. Yes. So what they, uh, what they do is they release, um, there's certain brands of them that will release a hormone called progestogen. That hormone then has the effect of making the cervical mucus and the lining of your womb, not really hospitable to having anything like an embryo implanted into it. Yes. So they don't really affect you know significantly what your ovaries are doing so you're still having a cycle in the background by and large but they will stop something implanting so they stop pregnancy by by you know there's nothing there for for something to implant into they're usually inserted either by your gp or in a well woman clinic or a clinic like mine or your gynecologist and there is another type of coil called a copper coil yes so the copper coil doesn't contain hormones there's no progestogen in it it has a sort of irritating effect on the lining of the womb and it's spermicidal. So it's going to, it's toxic to sperm as part of how it, it, how it works. And again, there's loads of different brands. They often last for five to 10 years, those copper coils. Again, they're inserted by your GP, women's clinic, gynecologist, whoever you're happy with. Um, one thing, one drawback of the copper coils is that they're not great for heavy bleeding. Whereas the hormonal coils can really make your periods stop or lighter or more manageable. Okay, very interesting. I'm a bit biased <laughs> towards the hormonal ones because the <laughs> ones, you'll often see women come back with heavy bleeding and that can be... Okay. Yeah. So, but for somebody who's very sensitive to the hormones, maybe the copper coil would be a great option. But for someone who already yeah. suffers with um, heavy bleeding, it's just really probably not the way to go and that there's, there's other coil options there. Yeah, that's true. So, and it's a really, again, it goes back to, I'm like a stuck record. It goes back to the individual, you know, individualization yeah. of all of this, but that's true. And there is so at, many moving parts, isn't there? Like, oh yeah. You know, and like, we're all so different, you know, yeah. and there's an unpredictability to this. Like one of the nice things about the reversible contraceptions, like the pill and so on, is that someone doesn't get on well with it. They can instantly stop it. And those hormones are out of your system in 24 hours. Yeah, I was going to ask, how long does it take? So if you felt, whoa, this is not me, I don't feel right. And uh, I, you know, say you had been on the pill. Um, so 24 hours, is it? Well, if you think, think about it, it must be because otherwise we wouldn't see that breakthrough ovulation happen. Oh, yeah, yeah, like exactly. Pill, you know? um, so now the only thing is for some women, when they stop the pill, I get asked a lot about its impact on fertility you know, am I going to change my ability to get pregnant down the line if I take contraception when I'm in my teens or my twenties? So the depo, that injection, that can have a very long time before, once you stop it, before your natural cycle, your ovulation kicks back in. I really think anything up to a year would be kind of average. Okay. So if you're in your whatever age, but you're planning a pregnancy. Pregnancy. I'd avoid the, the depo injection. For women on the normal pill, we'd expect the majority to start having periods and ovulate really from the month that they stopped the pill, but anything up to six months can be normal to, you know, you can have a few months lag before your periods kick back in and you start ovulating. Anything up to six months would be normal. Right. Okay. It's, it's fascinating. And I hear you talk there for the last few minutes on, on all the different options and you, you know, over the years I've tried so many myself, you know, and it is, a bit like that though you have to 
find your groove with it and when you're younger um maybe to try those uh options that if it's not working for you that it you know you can you can swap quite easily um and get used to it as well error. i suppose it's trial and error to find you know what what suits someone you know and then you would mention say acne um in the past something i empathize with so um and we so that might influence when we're looking at different brands of pill we know that some of the some of the progestogens that are in some of those brands are better at having a good effect on acne than others Mm -hmm. and so you'd be leaning towards one of them as a preference over maybe one of the other types you know so that's why it's a you know you have to have a a good sort of in-depth discussion about what someone's expectations are and what they're trying to achieve yeah so it's not just talk to your friend and see what she's on because that might not necessarily work for you you need to have a good long conversation with your doctor and and be open and honest about the actual reasons why you you need it um and, and what it could help with whether it be um you know other symptoms as well and to look at all the options um, and I think a lot of people don't know that when they're on birth control uh, it can cause nutritional deficiencies as well and um, so it is very important that you're really looking after yourself and nourishing yourself and making sure that you're supplementing as well with can we talk a little bit about uh, regular cycles yeah and they I mean they can be very frustrating because if you're trying to you're busy or you're in school or you're playing sports or you're no matter who you are having really unpredictable irregular cycles can be really frustrating and really disruptive. And the, whether it's the pill or some other form of hormonal contraception, they're often very good at, um, at improving that and giving you more predictability about bleeding. And then most types of hormonal contraception will reduce the amount of bleeding as well. So you're pain and the amount of bleeding can often be reduced yeah i was going to say that so not to be concerned if your periods do start to change and a lot of the time they can reduce a lot yeah the the most effective the marina so if you look at the hormonal progestogen containing coils intrauterine devices to give them their proper names um there are three in particular they are different, they contain different amounts. So there's sort of different doses if you want to think of them that way. The marina coil is the one that's probably most commonly used. Yeah. And it uh it is probably the most effective, not it's the most effective non-surgical option when it comes to controlling um periods. So it can reduce the amount of bleeding uh, for about 60, 70% of women, their periods actually stop, which is really handy to know. Um, and uh, so yeah, so that's really important. Okay, very good. Um, so so what, one of the side effects I get asked the most about is whether or not these different types of birth control can cause you to gain weight. Right. Um, so technically speaking, if you look at the research that's out there, the majority don't, with the exception of the depot, that injection that you get every three months. The coil, the birth control pill, the mini pill, etc., they shouldn't cause women to gain weight. Now, you can get some bloating as a consequence in the first few months, just as a side effect, that should settle down. But in saying that there are, there's probably outliers as there always are. You, there's maybe, I don't know what percentage, a small percentage who do gain weight because of being on one of these types of birth control. It's really unpredictable. So we've no way of knowing when someone starts. Because when I was younger, I heard this all the time. Oh, if you go on such and such, you're going to put on a ton of weight, blah, blah, blah. But where did all that come from? It must have come in the, the news or something at some point, because I'm even aware of that uh, information, but you're saying it's not necessarily true. No, I think if you actually stick to the kind of the, the research base that's out there, it would suggest that if you look at the patterns and trends of weight gain for women, either on hormonal birth control or not, it's quite similar there. We don't see this kind of excessive weight gain happening in the hormonal group. Um, mm. but all I'm saying, I'm just acknowledging that there will always be outliers to that. And there will yeah. be a percentage of women who do gain weight. And, um, but it's not the typical, and it's not something that I, I think someone should say, Oh, I'm not going to try any hormonal contraception because I'm so worried about gaining weight. Um, okay. it shouldn't, it shouldn't put you off, you know? Absolutely. Now that's a very valid point. Um, so just recently, um, the health minister, uh, Stephen Donnelly, has launched free contraception contraception scheme for women aged 17 to 25. 
I'm unfortunately not in that category anymore. Yeah, neither do I. Neither. <laughs> but um, what an amazing move. Like that would have been so super when we were younger. I and know. it's a great thing to see happen. I know. And it's not, you know, it's not just for women with a medical card. It's for anybody aged 17 to 25, right up until the day of your 26th birthday. Great to see that there's advancements happening, you know. Absolutely. Yeah. It's all in development, hopefully. So it's something to keep an eye on, you know, that your options are constantly changing. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm trying to think of like other things that kind of crop up on a day-to-day basis in the clinic um, where we would be quite, um, you know, we'd be supportive of women who maybe wanted to go down the route of getting an intrauterine device just because they're so convenient. Um, But I find that a lot of women are turned off because they're worried about the actual procedure of having it inserted. Yes, this is a huge thing on TikTok, by the way, because um, I'm nowhere near cool enough to be on TikTok, Donna. (laughs) (laughs) We're all about that TikTok life, but actually the insertion of the coil has come up quite a lot on our For You page. And the main feedback is because of the pain that it causes and it's and all women are being offered is a cup of tea and a hot water bottle. God, I mean, they're lucky if they're even offered a, a cup of tea mm-hmm. and a hot water bottle, I think, you know. Um, so I feel really strongly about this because I think it's part and parcel of how we approach women's health in general and how we approach our, our expectations for women's pain and all that kind of thing. Mm. So, yeah, I feel really strongly about this. I think it's, it is part and parcel of, of what we expect women to ensure when it comes to medical things. And this kind of like attitude of just grin and bear it or like it's only a few minutes. Like, I mean, it'd be like going to the dentist and thinking, I'm just going to pull that tooth out, but I won't give you any anesthetic or pain relief. Like, no. So this happened to me, right? I went and I, I got the coil put in and I nearly passed out because it was so horrific and I was told to take two Panadol before I went in I got it done and I have never experienced anything like it in my life I was traumatized and I went home on my own and I was shaking for the rest of the day um and just from being on TikTok seeing this happening that a lot of women have had this experience so what what's going on there and why aren't we being um uh, why aren't we getting that preparation work there before we get a procedure the attitude that has existed for years in medicine towards I, I think towards women maybe people would argue it's just towards patients in general I don't know but it's the same reason when you know for women in labor uh, that you know historically there wouldn't have been a discussion properly about what their analgesia their pain relief options are and I know it's got better and that's good yeah. and it's much more um addressed now but but in in a kind of primary care setting like in general practice with your gp in a women's health clinic so you sh- this is what should happen you should be adequately counseled so you should be walked through what a coil procedure involves we have dummies of the coil and you know in a little mm-hmm. dummy womb to show you yeah. exactly what happens and if someone has never had a cervical smear or anything like that, you know, we, we show them a speculum, like the instrument that we use, um, so which helps us look inside the vaginal canal. And we talk them through. So we put a speculum in. This is what's going to happen. You, We put a speculum in. This is the position you're going to be in on the bed. Um, once we put that speculum in, then that allows me to see your cervix, which is the neck mm-hmm. of your womb. And then I'll, I'll introduce a small um, instrument which is called a sound is the technical term for it, but it's a really long, thin um, plastic instrument, which lets me measure the distance from the cervix to the other side, the inside of the top of your womb. So where I'm, it's going to help me figure out where to place your coil. Yes. You're going to get a cramp when I do that. As I pass that sound through your cervix, through that canal, it's not going to like it. And you're probably going to have a period cramp, but I'm going to warn you before I do it. And I'll let you know, you know, and we'll count through it together. Once I've done that, then I know exactly how far to put your coil in. And from your perspective, it's just that sensation one more time, but this time I'm passing the coil in, but it should feel the same. You get another cramp. So basically the coil is mounted into this long plastic tube that gets passed through the neck of your womb into your womb. I press a little button, which releases that coil and I take the whole instrument out. So we've, we've measured the length of your womb. So the next step that we do is place the coil. So again, that 
T-shaped device is mounted into this long plastic thing that goes in through the neck of your womb, into your womb. I press a button which releases the coil and I take the plastic thing out. And you get a cr- another, it's a period cramp. It shouldn't be painful, but it should feel like a very bad cramp period cramp and again I'll talk you through that and I'm gonna you know I'm gonna give you I'll count you into it so you know when to expect it but once that's done you're gonna get a few minutes of cramping that should then settle down after a few minutes this is the typical I cut the little strings that come out Mm -hmm. of your coil I cut them inside you're not gonna feel that I take that speculum out and we're gonna leave you lying flat for a few minutes until that cramping subsides so that like you should be walked through but to never got any of that (laughs) quiver You should be shown what the, what the, otherwise you're lying on the bed and you can hear opening of this and clanging of that. And like, you should know what these instruments look like. I think big enough procedure. It really is like, it's, it should be straight. Like it should quick enough. And like, in we do a 30 minute um, uh, appointment time for an IUD insertion, but like 20 minutes of that is probably taken up by counseling, you know? Yeah. Um, so it should be for most people when it is straightforward, it should be very quick. And the actual insertion of the IUD itself should only take a couple of minutes at most, but depends on the anatomy of the person lying in front of you, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and in terms of getting to help anything to help with the pain beforehand, is yeah, that- take an anti-inflammatory, not paracetamol. So paracetamol is not going to do much. Um, so we would usually give at the same time as we're giving someone a prescription for the coil, we give them a prescription for Ponstan, which is a really good strong Mm anti-inflammatory to take an hour or so before they come into their appointment and then a couple extra that they can take for the next day or two after they've had it inserted okay Um, often i like it's too much to go into now but we talk them through what to expect post procedure what's normal what isn't when to contact us and then you arrange a review for about four to six weeks like it it, it's a big it's mostly counseling but the actual procedure itself a lot of it comes down to being in the right position so you need a proper like we've a proper gynecological gynecological bed with stirrups which I know is kind of intimidating but it is easier for everyone and because it's, you're it's in- probably needed and you're and mm. like the, the the local GP more than likely wouldn't have that equipment like the the bed depends even. on your GP and you, I'm not saying you yeah. have to have it done in that but I think those yeah. things help being in a warm environment in a room that you feel as private not lying there shivering because you're in this yes. room and you're half naked and little things like that and I think by far I when I worked in the women's clinic I was in before I was doing three or four coils a week at least so you get better at them over time you know and I found the most impactful thing was to communicate was to chat to the patient sometimes it's just distraction like you're just trying to distract them as you're doing it yeah and sometimes it's to make they they then have a confidence in you that you're yeah. not going to suddenly surprise them with something painful or you know but giving adequate pain relief before they come in is important I know some of the clinics actually even inject local anesthetic into the cervix um, yes. so well, that's good to hear that you know that that is being addressed and you know as well then if you were considering getting something like that whether it be the coil or see the bar is that a big procedure or um having your having a bar inserted actually is is quite straightforward we pop in a tiny bit of local anesthetic and then you have to there's ways of sort of picking where you're going to put it we have to anatomically mark it and then it comes on this it looks like a stapler for all the world Mm -hmm. it comes i know it comes on this pre-loaded device basically okay local anesthetic in there the local anesthetic stings for a few seconds you shouldn't feel right then you will have a very sore bruised arm for a few days yeah i'd say yeah i always avoided that one because i thought "Mm, that seems very painful but then i went for the coil and i was not expecting that (laughs) yeah so i wish that i wish that you had been my doctor for that because it sounds like you have give you give people the time and put them in a relaxed state and i suppose that's a very good thing to be mindful of when you go for a procedure like that to to, you need to be feeling very comfortable and that you know who you've decided to um to go to to get this um device um has you know the ability to to uh, do it for you without 
huge amounts of pain or um, trauma. <laughs> and so some people anatomically, like, you know, we're going blind with, with this device as we go in through the neck of your womb. We can't see where we're actually putting it. So if you're under sedation with gynecology, they'll often do it under either camera guidance or ultrasound guidance, whatever it might be. It's usually camera, which is called a hysteroscopy. They put a camera into your womb and they can actually see where they're placing the coil. Um, so we can't do that. And some people inside their, your cervix is a few, two or three centimeters long yeah. on average. You might have a little kink in your cervix or a polyp or something internally that we can't see. And we hit a brick wall, essentially. That's what it feels like as you're trying to pass it's like going through a blocked pipe like you just can't, you know you can't and mm -hmm. I think a lot of the expertise comes in knowing when to say this isn't it should be easy and this isn't working and I need to stop and you need to go to gynecology to have this inserted yes yes wow okay that's amazing insight really is I just want to go back to um the free contraception for a minute so yeah. The Minister for Health, Stephen Donnelly, has launched um, the free contraception scheme for women aged 17 to 25 who reside in Ireland. So how can they avail of this? What do they do? What are their first steps? I think reaching out to your GP, any women's health clinic, even a clinic like mine, um, or, you know, um, the contraception clinics that exist out there, like the Well Women's Centre, etc., all of these places can offer um, this free contraception. And it is, it's dependent on what you want. Like the coil is covered, um, the bar is covered, the pill is covered. So it's a discussion about what contraceptive needs or aims or goals somebody has. And really everything is then covered as part of that. And you don't have to have a medical card. So you can be a private patient and still go and, and avail of this, which is great up until your 26th birthday. Amazing. So that so the appointment as well to discuss your options is free too, as well as the insertion of the coil or the procedure if you're going down that route. Yeah. So anyone who is aged 17 to 25 can go to their local GP or um and um, find somebody like um uh, yourself, Viva, or or um say at the Well Women's Centre, um and they can go in have a discussion around their options and have a really good conversation. I think that's the main takeaway from today as well is talk to your doctor and tell them why you feel you need it and and what and really discuss your options the the good and the bad uh, and and um you know maybe easing yourself into it with something that's maybe not too long term when you're first trying and like we discussed it's a a pick a mix over the years you have to try and and find what works for you and um and and uh, there is a lot of good options there which is fantastic and you said there's a lot of advancement advancements coming as well so um yeah, it's so constantly just, changing so you know keep talking yes so we, we we just uh have you got three key tips on contraception and birth control we do this in every podcast and i'm yes. never prepared <laughs> the three key tips. Prepared with my three key tips okay one is know that contraception isn't just contraception so birth control can be used for things that are not just for birth control it doesn't have to just be to stop you getting pregnant it can be for managing heavy painful periods acne um periods that are a nuisance that are irregular whatever you know, your particular issue is, um, but it's not just for birth control. Number two is there are loads of options. And if the pill didn't suit you or something else, something else might suit you. So it is always worth that discussion because there's actually, you know, with time passing, there's more and more options available to women of any age. Um, so it is something to absolutely discuss and not be put off just because you had a bad experience with one type. And the third is, I think, to... Um, not be afraid. like if you're going for something like a procedure I think just harking back to what we were saying I think it is really important to say look I'm really concerned about the potential the pain or the you know the aftercare or whatever and to make sure that discussion happens before you go in fantastic Quiva thank you so so much for your time today it was really really informative and I hope that it helps other people to uh, know their options and know what's available to them thank you so much for your time today Thanks, Donna. Thank you so much for joining us on the Key For Her podcast. We'd be so grateful if you could hit subscribe, rate and share this podcast with your friends. For tips, tricks and hacks and all things perimenopause, menopause, periods, menstrual cycles and skin health, 
Follow us at Key For Her on TikTok and Instagram. Check out our website, keyforher.com, for more information. Thank you.